continue on today in the firepower sermon series. As long as God continues to drive me in this area, and I don't mean that in a negative sense, I mean fueled with a passion that God is fueling my heart. I'm hearing over and over in the church more, which greatly encourages my heart, people talking about the fire and talking about the passion. And this is becoming more prevalent in our thoughts and our thinking now. And so it must. We must, we must begin not only to have the reality of it, but we must continue to see ourselves as passionate, faith-filled people that have the Holy Ghost just running over in our lives. Uh, otherwise, we're going to fail the mission for why we are here on the earth. And the message that God has given me today is a message called a bonfire. And it is something that must be in and upon our lives in a great way to have our whole being consumed with the fire of God. And I'm going to bring you to Jeremiah in a moment, but this, I love AI. It helps me create these weird pictures nowadays, you know, to, to help me describe. But Jeremiah talked about a fire in his bones and that it was there passionately. And he had to open his mouth and let the fire out unto the world today. And so we have to do the same. So a bonfire. We, we have bonfires, and that's kind of a play off of that, a bonfire. We get a bonfire going, and it just radiates out. It, it radiates heat. It radiates light. It radiates joy as people rally around a time of such a fire. And so they will where a spiritual fire is concerned. Jeremiah 20 and 9 says this from Jeremiah. But if I say I'll never mention the Lord or speak his name, his word burns in my heart like a fire. It is like a fire in my bones. I am worn out trying to hold it in. I can't do it. Boy, I like that statement. And then Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. So we see here, as I start this message off today, and then want to backtrack to Jeremiah. Jeremiah here, in the whole 20th chapter, if you have time to read it when you go home, read in fact, it would do you good to read 1 through 9. I know it, it's pretty lengthy, but you catch up on these words that Jeremiah is sending out from the Lord. But in Jeremiah chapter 20, he gave him a particular word to give to Israel. Because Israel at the time of Jeremiah was doing what our world is doing today. They were backslid, they were cold, they were indifferent, they were idolatrous. They were hateful, they were mean, they were despising. And God gave him a word to give uh, to the people in his day. And Jeremiah comes back with this complaint against God. Because when Jeremiah gave this word, it caused Pashur, who was the leader of that time, to come up and physically strike him and hit him once he gave this word. And then he gave the command for 24 hours to put him in stocks and bonds, which in those days was very torturous. It was a public humiliation. It was a public shame to have to go through that torture and humiliation, all for speaking the word of God. And he felt like God had abandoned him. He felt like God had deceived him. I think he actually uses the word. He said, he deceived me into speaking this because Jeremiah didn't get what he thought he would get in return. And that's the problem a lot of times in society when we step out and proclaim the words of God and things don't happen like we think they ought to have happened.
Because we have this mindset that something different is going to transpire because we're speaking the words of God. How many of you know that every time you speak the word of God, somebody is not always going to rejoice? Amen. I wish they would because it's the great and wonderful word from God. So I'm going to back up one verse here for a moment in Jeremiah 20 and verse 8 and then read the first part of verse 9. He said, for whenever I prophesy, he, here's what he said, I must cry out, violence and destruction are coming. Now I want to stop there just for a moment because we preachers get into a situation to where we don't want someone to stereotype us in a way that, that all they're preaching is violence or all they're preaching is destruction. All they're preaching is that the end time is coming. And people will give them backlash and people will give them grief over that because literally people like even in Israel's day under Jeremiah don't want to hear it. But the truth is the truth. Amen? And when you come into a particular season that you are in in God, and we are in the ultra last days, I believe. When Peter stood on the day of Pentecost and declared what was happening from the outflow of the Holy Spirit, he quoted Joel, and Joel said, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit. And that's been over 2,000 years ago. And he called them the last days. How many of you realize we're in the last days? And in the last days, this world is going to come under the judgment of God because we in America, and especially in the world, we are not living the principles that we used to live. We are not where we used to be in the Lord. We're not necessarily a so-called Christian nation, but we are a Christian nation because we go by those values or we have, but we have gone far away from that. And when God gives his preachers and his prophets and his people the word to say this is coming and that's coming, get ready, get yourself prepared. Rather than making a mockery of it, you would do yourself wise to heed the word of God and understand that you better get a fire inside your soul and get ready for what is about to transpire. I'm not going to stand here and tell you peace and safety and goodness and everything's going to be okay when the fire of God that's burning in my soul is not telling me that's what's coming. Amen? Y'all okay out there, right? Amen. Hear me when I'm telling you. And this is what that uh, Jeremiah had to say. Whenever I prophesy, I must cry out. Violence and destruction are coming because it's the message of the Lord. The message from the Lord has made me an object of continual insults and derision. Sometimes I think I will make no mention of his message and I will not speak as his messenger anymore. He's, in other words, he's under that temptation. If this is all I've got to say, if that's all you're propelling me to say today, that I'm not going to speak anymore because they ridicule, they mock me, and they make fun of me for what I'm saying. Listen to me. You've got to come to the place that you don't care whether they mock you. You don't care whether they laugh at you. You don't care whether they make faces behind your back or whatever. If you are letting God's word come out of your soul to the world that he needs to have saved and redeemed again, then God will bless you no matter what the world does to you. Can I get an amen from anybody? He will bless you. But many people don't want to put themselves in that place today. And this is where this message is going today. Jeremiah was distressed because he gave his mouth to the Lord to speak his prophetic words to Israel. And he felt like God didn't hold his end of the bargain up. He thought like, if I'm going and sharing God's word, if I'm telling them the truth and the truth will set you free, and I'm telling them this great and wonderful message or even a message that will cause them to turn from, to back to God because of the violence and destruction that's coming, why are they not happy? Why are they not receiving this word that the Lord has come to give them? Listen, he wanted to quit. He wanted to give up. He wanted to throw up his hands. He didn't want any more a part of it. Now listen, some of you may have already been a quitter, but it's time to turn around and get hold of the word of God and go tell them. 
If you quit something every time things do not go the way you expected them, how many times a week do you think you'd be quitting? I mean, how many times do you say in your life in a week, that didn't turn out the way I thought it was going to? Because how much stuff does in life? Very seldom does it really turn out the way you want it to. And especially with the gospel, if you know you are proclaiming the truth of God's word, then stand on it, people, and do not be moved off the gospel, and do not be a quitter. How many of you really expect that the world and its people who are given over to idolatry should be happy and pleased if God asks you to deliver a stinging rebuke to people's sinful ways. They're not going to be happy about it because they're happy in their sins. They're happy in their contentment. They're happy in their ways. And a good portion of God's church is happy in complacence in complacency today and the word that God gave to Jeremiah for the people of Israel was a word of punishment judgment and destruction why because they had turned their backs on God and would not return to him after many admonishments that he had given them he would say repent he would he would relent from his actions against them and ask them to repent and to come back to God and time and time again they rebelled against him this is the same word that america must hear destruction and judgment is coming and it is soon if we don't turn from our wicked ways amen it is soon to happen it is not at your door right now you should even be able to hear the echoes of the knockings taking place and I've shared with you and been candid with you from the beginning of this year if you want yourselves a happy-go-lucky message I'm sure we can find you a church that will help you in that realm but if you want to get prepared for what is coming hear what God is telling us here in the word today and the same word that America must hear even as Ezekiel come to bring to bring unto them you might ask well what sins and rebellions are this judgment intimate for in America today? Well, all we have to do is turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 to find out. He said, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times, for people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful they will consider nothing sacred they will be unloving and unforgiving they will slander others and have no self-control they will be cruel and hate what is good they will betray their friends be reckless be puffed up with pride and love pleasure rather than God they will act religious but they will reject the power that could make them godly stay away from people like that now that's not a pretty picture and I didn't paint it that's the picture that God gave to Timothy of what it would look like in the last days how many of you see what I just read that is a part of the last days right now we see this on a faster scale than we've ever seen it before there is such hatred and vitriol in our nation today people are out of control I have never witnessed the things that I have witnessed today to where people are their own law they're going about to do their own thing they don't care what the law what the government what anything says we're out there as a bunch of renegades in the world today trying to prove that our way is the way it is the sign that Jesus is coming and there must be a fire in your belly and there must be a fire in your bone to speak to the people of this world that we we can bring them back to a relationship with Jesus Christ and help them to understand he alone is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and he can change their lives even in the midst of this sinful and adulterous generation through the power of the Holy Spirit we can live a righteous and an overcoming life through him alone amen through his power and through his anointing but it doesn't change 
the symptoms that will be here in the last days. And Jeremiah was trying to preach this message to keep his people from going into greater bondage, into greater torture, into greater misfortune. But they would not listen. You see, seeing the world is under condemnation already. We then must not be a source of condemnation to the world. We don't have to go about trying to condemn them. We don't have to go about pointing out how bad and how horrible they are. They were born into sin. They were born sinful. And they need a Savior, Jesus Christ. And we, while we must proclaim the message of what is about to happen to a world that's run amok and that, that, is, that is doing everything to blaspheme God and to stick their finger in his high, we must be ready to proclaim the message that Jesus Christ can bring them to the place that they need to be. Amen? So we don't have to condemn them. Some people think, well, I just need to go show you how bad you are. No, they already are bad. You don't have to point that out. Show them how good God is. Even in the midst of why we're having to proclaim that the world needs to change because this is coming if you don't straighten up. Amen? You see, that is our call and we must not withhold the truth of God's word even if it is unpleasant to us well I'm not going to say that pastor if it's going to rock somebody's boat well I ain't going to say that if that's going to get somebody upset and they're going to cuss at me and they're going to shout and they're going to do this now I'm just going to keep my mouth shut well I'm not asking and nobody's saying and Jeremiah wasn't doing that he wasn't saying something to rile somebody up he was saying what God wanted him to say. And when you put yourself in the position of just saying what God wants you to say, and you know it's what God wants you to say, God will take care of his words. Amen? He will. But we must not withhold the fire. Suppress it. Snuff it. Push it down until it dies out. And that's what Jeremiah was tempted to do. But he said, man, I'm weary holding this word in, and I cannot do it. The Apostle Paul, or the Apostle John, he sent stinging rebukes and warnings to at least four of the seven churches of Asia. He told them, God will remove the candlestick. God's going to bring you under this judgment of death. All the things he spoke, but he had an unpleasant word, but he had a word that was trying to bring them back to redemption and finding God to be the center of their world again. But he had to speak that word. Samuel had to announce to King Saul because of his pride and because of his arrogance that God had pulled the kingdom from him and that he would no longer be the king of Israel. And for Samuel to step into that role knowing the arrogance and the hatred in the heart of Saul, he was putting his life at risk to say such a thing. But he spoke it. Jonah was told to share the message of repentance to Nineveh or God would destroy the entire city and them within it. God has never promised that there would not be a steep price to pay for lending our tongues to the Lord. Sometimes there is. Sometimes there isn't. But we've got to follow the Lord. In John 16 and verse 33, he said, I've told you all this so that you may have peace in me. That's the greatest thing when you're going about in this last day and you are going to be a mouthpiece for the Lord. You must first have peace in God. When you obtain peace in God, everything else of God will come out rightly and wonderfully, even though it may be strong and forthright. You will have peace in me. Here on this earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. This preaching today is not about setting up the kingdom here on earth. There's preachers that follow that kingdom now preaching that believe that we're going to be able to find the righteous and put them in places and positions and they'll be able to make laws and, and cause people. No, you're never going to be able to legislate righteousness. You're never going to be able to by law demand people that they are going to be good in life. But as we proclaim God's word, they 
there is a kingdom coming, hallelujah, to when he will rule over all mankind and peace will be there. But until then, we are going to have tribulations and trials on this earth and we must learn to stand planted and firm and secure in God and not be moved. Amen? Not be moved. In John 15 and 19, he says, The world would love you as one of their own if you belong to it. How many of you belong to the world? How many of you belong to God? Amen. All right, so hear what John says. The world would love you. In other words, they'd receive anything from you if you belong to it. But you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world so it hates you. I don't know, Jeremiah reached that point in life. We see in Psalm 73 that Asaph reached that point to where he got so confused over all the turmoil he was going through because of the word of God and how that the evil and the wicked were doing more evil and more wickedness and getting richer and seemed to be prospering more and more. And Jeremiah was going through the same trial here. Why am I going through this? This world is wicked and it's on its way to hell. And, and, and I'm putting myself into a position to have them fire darts at me all the time and to try to keep me off guard because we want to be the mouthpiece of God. And we are not of the world. Therefore, the world hates those who love Jesus Christ. He has, however, promised this, that if you and I will speak what he asks us to speak, it will come to pass. Amen? Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words, the Lord said, will never pass away. His word is good, it's solid, it's sure, and it will happen. You don't ever have to be worried about being in a situation to where if you're delivering God's word, that you're delivering a word that is not good. In Isaiah 55 and verse 11, he said this about his word. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me how? It will not return to me void. He's telling you that if you'll give his word, something's going to happen. It may, be, it may not be what you think will happen, but it will be what he wants to happen. He goes on to say that here. When he said, it shall not return to me, but it shall accomplish what? What I please. Who, me? No, God. It will accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. So God has his word. God had it through Jeremiah. God has it through you. You've got friends. You've got relatives. You've got sons. You've got daughters. And you better begin to share with them and tell them what is coming. You better know the times in which you are living. You better know what's going to happen to a world who rejects God. Just as the Israelites, when they continued and continued and continued, God allowed them to go into that Babylonian captivity for 70 years to humble them down. He had to bring them out of Egypt even. God does not want us and this world living in bondage, but he wants us to live in freedom. Amen? So that word must go forth. Many Christians, unfortunately, today are ashamed of God's word. Can I ask you something without you responding? Are you ashamed of God's word? Now you have to take what I just said in the context of asking when's the last time you shared it with anybody? When's the last time that you actually broke the bread with someone? You may say personally, no, I love the word of God. But be, when he says being ashamed, that word ashamed has to do with your relation to the outer world. It doesn't have to do with you on the inside of your home and inside of your life. It has to do with the outer relationship. And many Christians are ashamed 
and will do anything to avoid any backlash that God's word might cause them. Folks, there is a war on Christianity that is heating up right now to a degree like we've never witnessed. Our own president of the United States is making war against Christians. He has adjusted Title IX just in these past few weeks to go into effect in August that he's going to make it easier for your sons to be arrested and thrown into jail when they supposedly do things of discrimination. And we all know when it's wrong, it's wrong. But they're, they're, they're going to fix, they fix these laws to where they're, they're rescinding laws to where that you even have the ability to cross-examine the accuser that's accusing you. They're just going to be allowed in some cases to accuse them and make accusations because we stand with the word of God. They're giving LBTQ plus people greater freedoms, gender identity people who want to identify as a dog or a horse or a cat or a mouse or a man or a woman or whatever they want to do. This is not government. This is not politics. This is war on Christianity. This is war on righteousness. It's war on right living. It's war on morality. It's war. And if we don't learn to combat it with the word of Almighty God, we are going to find ourselves in a place that it's not going to be pretty. Amen? We must understand what is happening. So many are ashamed of God's word. Therefore, the only thing that comes out of their mouths is the same word the false prophets gave, and I'm talking about Christians that are ashamed of the word of God. The only thing that comes out of their word is the same word the false prophets gave to the Israelites when they were trying to draw them away from God. The word was peace and safety. Don't worry, everything's going to be all right. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 2 through 3. For you know quite well that the day of the Lord, Lord's return, will come unexpectedly, like a thief in the night. When people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin, and there will be no escape. Oh, the message is so tempting. It's all going to be good. It's all going to be well. Don't worry about all this evil. Don't worry. It's just a phase. It's just a temporary symptom that everybody's going through. Everything cycles in life. It'll cycle around. No, it don't. I'm telling you that the, 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 the left and the progressives have entrenched themselves in every institution that in, in places used to hold up the word and hold up righteous living, and they have corrupted it and are beginning to bring it down. It's not going to be okay in life. It's not. The very same Christians who say they're saved and going to heaven, in many cases, will not even raise a finger to warn the wicked and the world concerning the judgment that is nigh at our doors because we just don't want the trouble. And that's what the temptation of Jeremiah. Complacency in the Christian circles has smothered the fire of God's word in many of a Christian's lives. In Ezekiel 3, he issues a strong word, I believe, to Christians. Ezekiel 3, 17 through 18. Son of man... I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. Strong word. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked ways to even save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. You say, well, that's a little stern, Pastor Jeff. You say, well, am I a watchman? I believe in the New Testament God has made us all watchmen. 
We're all people who are standing and watching on the hill for the dangers that are coming. And we have to be willing that when we see what's coming down the pike to warn the world and to point them to life and to point them to joy and to point them to God Almighty who is our keeper. Someone might ask here, but pastor, really? Am I my brother's keeper? That's what Cain asked in Genesis 4, 9. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? That's the question I want to pose to you right now. In this church here at Brookstone, to those who are listening by social media on this today, are you your brother's keeper? Are you a watchman? Are you someone who God has given to stand in the gap and to make up the hedge and to block the enemy? He said, I sought for someone who would stand in that gap, who would make up that hedge, who would prevent the evil from flowing into my people. And the sad answer to that was, I found no one. There is none righteous he said, he says, Jesus even said, when I come in the last day, will I find faith? These are provocative questions he's asking because he realizes that with the end time of the world, he also realizes that the Bible teaches that the love of many shall wax cold, that our flame will go out, that our complacency will take over as Christians. And that we also need to have a fire restarted in our life. The word brother here in Genesis 4 and 9 not only means that it's a sibling, but it also refers to a person who was of the same likeness that you are. The human race, we're brothers and sisters. We all stem from Adam and Eve. And he's saying to us that we are the keepers of the world today to bear the message of Christ. Mordecai warned Esther about the consequences of not speaking up for her brothers and sisters while she was living the good life in the palace, having all the comforts and all the wonderful things. And an edict had been signed that all the Jews were going to be destroyed. And Mordecai he had a fire in his bones. He had fire in his spirit. And he was grieved. And he put on sackcloth and, and, and put ashes on him. And he went to the gate and he fasted and he prayed because he knew that if somebody didn't step in the gap and make up the hedge, his people were going to be destroyed. And I come to tell you today, if in America Christians don't step up, stand up, and take their place, there's going to be a destruction like we have never seen oh why we live and hide in complacency in Esther 4 and 14 listen to the opening question he asked her if you keep quiet at times or at a time like this if you keep quiet do you know what time this is do we understand I know we get caught up in our day-to-day -day functions. We all do. But do you know what time it is? Esther evidently had not come to a full awareness of what time it was. It's time to act. It's time to do something. And that's what he was trying to tell her. He says, if you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief, for the Jews will arise from some other place. He's telling us here at Brookstone, if you don't arise and speak the word with a fire in your soul, if you will not honor me, no matter whether you get backlash or whether you get goodness into your life or not, I will go until I find the people who are willing to carry it out for me. I will find an avenue. God always has. God always will. He don't need mighty armies. God can save by many or by few. He could use one. He could use 10,000. It doesn't matter. And that's what he's saying here. 
yeah, if you keep quiet, then the relief for the Jews will arise from, other, from some other place. But you, listen to this, and your relatives will die. He's saying the complacent person, the one who lets the fire go out, he says, there'll be a death, whether it's spiritual death, whether it's the fire going out, whatever it may be. He said, it will result in that you didn't step up to help stop the evil that's coming. And he says, if you sit there in your complacency, the very thing you didn't stop will come on you. That's a strong word, isn't it? That's a sobering word right there. I don't even say that in joy. That's horrible in a way to say. Who knows if perhaps, Esther, you were made queen for just such a time as this. God caused every one of you right here in this church to be born for this specific time. He didn't put you in the 16, the 17, and the 1800s. He put you right here in the years of 2000 because he knew that he could use you to touch this world. You have come to the kingdom. For such a time as this. Looking at yourself and quaking and fearing and saying you don't have the qualifications and you don't have all this and that, that's good. Because he wants you to look to him. It's not about your qualifications. It's not about your pedigrees. It's not about all the very things you have to give to God. It's what you have to offer him. And that is a house that he can feel. And when God comes into your house, he is a fiery inhabitant. Amen? He's a fiery inhabitant inside you. Praise be unto God. And that's what he spoke. If you keep quiet, look, we're either going to surrender to our culture or take a stand and tell the devil and his minions and his demons no more. In Jesus' name, go back to the pit of hell from which you came. We've got to tear down. The Bible tells us in Corinthians and other places in the Bible, he says we are to tear down every high thing that exalts itself against the word of God. Every lie, every falsity, every false doctrine, every demon that spews out lies. He's given you the authority to pull it down. By what? The word of truth. Hallelujah. For you shall know that truth and it shall set you free. And it shall set others free to know the truth of God's word. So you're either going to surrender to our culture or take a stand. You see, it's time to do something with the voice that God has given you. It's time to stoke the coal. It's time to do what Paul told Timothy, to stir up the gifts of God, to stir up those embers, to stir up those lonely coals that have been sitting there. It's time to let the Ruach, it's time to let the fire of God, the Holy Spirit, blow upon us and move us into the place that we ought to have in him today. Amen? It's time to do something. In Jonah chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, y'all know the story that Jonah, even though he had a hard word to bring, he also ran from God. Fearing for their lives, a storm. As you know, the storm took place in the sea when Jonah got on the ship and when he went down to Tarsh and boarded the ship. Fearing for their lives, the desperate sailors shouted to their gods for help and threw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. But all this time, mm, but all that, somebody say that with me, but all this time, say it again, Jonah was sound asleep in the hold. Look what his captain did. So the captain went down after him. How can you sleep at a time like this? I, I can't preach it any better than that. How can we sleep at a time like we're living today? He shouted, get up and pray to your God. Hallelujah. They didn't even really know who his God was. They needed relief, and they were trying to call on any God and every God that would stop this storm that was raging against them. And he said, man, you don't need to be sleeping. Get up and pray. 
The disciples went with Jesus to the Garden of Gethsemane and he said, watch and pray with me that you enter not into temptation. But three times he came back and they were asleep each time that he was going through agony and turmoil in the garden alone while they slept. And much of the church is sleeping. Get up and pray. To your God, maybe he will pay attention to us and spare our lives. we got a merciful God, don't we? Man, I don't care how rough it gets. He said, if you'll humble yourself, you'll repent of your sins, you'll turn from your wicked ways. He said, then will I hear from heaven, and I will forgive your sins, and I will heal your land. God wants to do that. James 4 and 17, so poignant, this scripture. Remember, it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then don't do it. You see, I I like what James put there because he took this into the areas of obedience of understanding it's not that you rejected this law or you rejected that law or you didn't do this command or whatever, but he says you knew inside your spirit the right thing to do and you didn't do it. And when you do that, he says, that is sin. Sin is so forgivable, but it so leads us down the wrong paths. Listen, Brad and Christy, y'all can come on. I don't know if you remember a prophet named Micaiah. Micaiah is a prophet in the book of 1 Kings. He's evidently one of them rare breeds. He don't take no flack off of nobody. I mean, he's just God's man. He's just God's person. Just like Jeremiah, just like Ezekiel, just like Isaiah, just like these great prophets of God. But Micaiah was offered an easy way out of his suffering. King Jehoshaphat and King Ahab, the wicked king of Israel that married Jezebel, had decided to come together and fight against another warring nation. But before they went to war, all of King Ahab's, 400 of them, prophets, all came together and said, Go, man! God's going to give you victory. Everything is good. Peace and safety. You're, you're just going to tear them apart. Everything's going to be good. Well, King Jehoshaphat at least had enough sense about him to know that 400 prophets speaking the same thing like that, he kind of doubted that. And he said, Is there not another prophet somewhere? <laughs> and King Ahab said, Yeah. There's one more, but that dude ain't never said anything good about me. That prophet ain't ever spoke a fancy good word about me. He always says something that I don't want to hear. And King Jehoshaphat said, go get him. I want to hear what it is that you have to say. And 1 Kings chapter 22 and verse 13 picks up to where they went and got him. Meanwhile, the messenger who went to get Micaiah said to him, Look, all the prophets are promising victory for the king. Be sure that you agree with them and promise victory for the king. Be sure. Let's get on the same page. Y'all hear this political thing nowadays, talking points? You know, you turn on the TV and all the Democrats are saying the same thing right down to the very same phrase and all the Republicans are doing the same thing, talking points. They come to Micaiah with a set of talking points and say, we're going to bring you before King Ahab and, and Jehoshaphat if you'll say what we tell you to say. If you'll speak what we tell you to speak, everything will be good. And folks, they're here now. They're here now in the form of our government, They're here now in the form of doctrines of demons that are coming out of hell. And they're just saying to us in this war that's come against the church, if you'll just say what we want you to say, if you'll not say what we want you to say, then everything will be cool. And skip over to verse 18. In fact, (laughs) Micaiah 
You can go ahead and read it. But he says, okay, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll say what the Lord wants me to say. He's kind of giving them the idea that, you know, just, just be cool. In verse 18, didn't I tell you the king of Israel, when he, he, he made a proclamation that the king was going to die, King Ahab. And he said, didn't I tell you the king of Israel exclaimed to Jehoshaphat, he never prophesies anything but trouble for me. Arrest him, in verse 26, the king of Israel ordered, take him back to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to my son Joash. Give them this order from the king. Put this man in prison and feed him nothing but bread and water until I return safely from the battle. I didn't put it here, but I like, oh, Micaiah took one last shot at him before he went away. He says, if you come back from the battle, what I've told you ain't true. And King Ahab didn't come back because you know the story how a lone warrior out there drew back a bow and an arrow and shot it at random. And that bow pierced the very weak point of Ahab's garment and killed him that day. But Micaiah would not bow down to those who wanted to feed him the language. We've seen churches already in our time this year disintegrating. Churches that used to be Pentecostal, solid churches that held up. Especially those who were created by John and Charles Wesley who held the word of God strong. But they followed the word of mankind. Putting abominations in their pulpits. Allowing their ministers to marry gay couples. It is an abomination. It is an abomination. And we must stand. We don't have to arrogantly do this. We don't have to try to make it seem like we're better than them. Just proclaim the word of God in humility. Knowing that if it weren't for God's grace, you would find yourself in a bad place too. Amen? But Micaiah didn't surrender. At times like this, can I ask you, do you even know what time it is? Do you even know what time it is on God's prophetic clock? Ask him, he'll tell you. Seek him, he'll put a fire inside of you. There'll be a compulsion inside of you that you'll be going to work and you'll be going to places and there's, there's just something burning inside of you. That burning is God. That burning is his word wanting to get out to share the gospel, to share the truth with people. Ask him. Haggai chapter 1, verses 4. Is it time? The question is asked. For you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple, or we could put that in modern language, or for his church to lie in ruins. Now, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts consider your ways. That is gold right there. Consider your ways. Verse 7. This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. Look at what's happening to you. Now go up into the hills, bring down the timber, and rebuild my house. Then I will take pleasure in it and be honored, saith the Lord. He's saying the fire's got to be rebuilt. The house has got to be rebuilt. The foundations must not be destroyed. They must be built upon because they're the only thing that will survive the shaking and the rumbling that's going to be taking place in this hour today. Quit feeling like you are complacent in your own panel houses. Get God church back into shape. Get the power and the fire and the Shekinah glory of God in our midst again and the power of God will begin to change and transform lives. Be not overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. That's what he's asking for us to do today. Elijah stood on that hill and he said how long will you halt between two opinions? If God is God, then serve him. But if Baal is God, then serve him. But I'm not giving you an in-between chamber anywhere. It's either in or out. It's either hot or cold. It's either a fire or not a fire in life. 
And God has come to Brookstone Church to bring the fire once again. And I'm telling you, it is on its way. I'm telling you, we're not where we want to be, where we need to be. But I'm telling you, by faith, as I preach these messages, the fire of God is on its way. There are people right now that are hunting for a church and a place where they can exemplify the presence and the power of God. And he's sending them. He's beginning to open the doors and bring them in. He's beginning to get you you to open the door of your mouth and proclaim the goodness of God in this defiled generation that we live, to warn them of the wrath that is to come and to find the grace of God that will never disappoint them. That is God. A fire in my bones. A fire in my bones. I tried to suppress it, Jeremiah said. I tried to just use every excuse in the book I could. In fact, in Jeremiah chapter 1, he gives the excuse that he's a child and he can't speak. And he says, I called you, I gave you the word, now speak it. Hallelujah. We, listen, this can't just be about a fiery message. This can't just be about a fiery sermon. This cannot just be about something that is spoken in my heart in pure passion. It must be a fire that begins to catch and burn and flame in our lives. I don't remember what it was for, but I remember that picture you gave me that's hanging in my office right now of the candles. And as one candle tripped and fell, it fell into another candle. And it lights another candle. And it falls into another candle until there's a fire burning like we've never seen. And I look at that picture every day of my life. And I say, we just need to have one candle to flip over and catch another one. And catch another one. And catch another one. And the flame will burn great and glorify our God, which is in heaven. If one... If one John Wesley, if one D.L. Moody, if one Charles Wesley, if one Billy Graham, if one somebody will take God's word for what it is and not worry about the consequence when you open your mouth to speak what God has put inside your soul, he will bring the fruit of his presence, the fruit of his power, the fruit of the Holy Spirit to bless this house like never before. Don't say it can't be done. Don't despise the days of small things, the Bible says. Don't despise those days when it begins seemingly infancy and small. I'm not looking for something to validate who I am to cause it to grow. I don't need that. I don't need any validation of any large church, any mega church, any of that. But I'll tell you what I want to rejoice in is when the saints of God come together and get fired up and begin to work as one team together in the power of the Holy Spirit to see him topple evil in our community and to bring down the powers of hell in our nation that we may see the light of God's glory again. Hallelujah. Mario Horabaki Shandolobosaya. My God, I'm full. My God, I feel a fire stemming in my being that is so intense. I'm telling you, I feel in my spirit that if we don't do it now, the opportunity will pass. If we don't catch hold of the flame now and ask God to baptize us in the fire and the Holy Ghost to do His will and His purpose in this life, I don't know. I don't know if there'll be many more chances around the bend. I don't know the mind of God. I don't know what He has planned, but I know the wickedness of this world. And I know what he's putting in his prophets across this land that they're trying to warn this nation to wake up. Oh, God, let us not be asleep at the wheel. Let us not be asleep in the garden. Lord, let us not be asleep in some comfortable palace. But, oh, God, may we pray for the fire to engulf us. I've been singing that song all week, all-consuming fire, all-consuming fire. Hallelujah. Lord, burn in me until nothing but purity comes. Let your Holy Spirit be 
have consumed the world. Oh, God. Lord, I wish I had other words also as Jeremiah did. I wish I had words that in this day and hour that could be on a different level, a different topic. But it's not the season. It's not the time. Those words will come as you give them. Those words will come as you insert them. But we must get ready. We must prepare. We must do battle. We must understand how to do spiritual warfare. We must understand that we're going to feel oppressed. There's times we're going to feel depressed. There's times that we are just like Jeremiah, going to feel like giving up, throwing up our hands, quitting, wondering why it's, it's worth anything that we're expending. But that we would remember that everything that we're doing, we're doing for God and we're doing for his kingdom. And when we realize that, the peace of God will conquer our souls and embolden us. Hallelujah. As Christy begins to sing, I'm just going to ask you to get up out of your seats and be drawn by the fire. I want you to come. Those of you that have a desire to know him even more. To let God put boldness inside you that doesn't speak arrogantly, but that speaks in humility and wisdom. But yet it speaks the unvarnished truth of God's word that will set people's souls free. Oh God, we come.